Hi, this is Margie Pera, Senior Director of Global Partnerships at Visa, and this is One on One with ABC Partners. Hi, this is Dave Almy of ADC Partners. How do athletes feel when their time as a competitor seems over? When the last fan leaves the stadium and the lights go out for what might be the final time? For British Olympian Margie Petter, the period that followed competing in the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia was a bit uncertain. After training so hard for that singular goal, she found that what came next presented its own somewhat unexpected challenges. Fortunately, the resiliency she'd honed in years of intense competition paid off in other ways. She moved to the U.S., swam competitively for USC, got her degree, and ultimately landed in the role she occupies today, leading Visa's partnership efforts with the NFL. In this episode, Margie and I talk about her path to the Olympics, the challenges associated with making the transition from the sports world to the business world, and what makes Visa so effective with their sports marketing efforts. Also, we talk about mashed peas for some reason. I don't know. Anyway, enjoy. Margie, how did competitive swimming actually start for you? Okay, like give us a sense of what that was like. I mean, how old were you? And what are some of your earliest memories associated with swimming competitively? Right at the very beginning, I'm the youngest of five children. Oh and I'm pretty sure my mom, who was a swimmer too, and all my siblings were swimmers, had to get me swimming as quickly as possible. So I'm pretty sure she threw me in a swimming pool as a two-year-old. And I, <laughs> I was going to say, like, the siblings just grabbed you by the ankles and chucked you in, huh? Yeah, I had to, I had to <laughs> think or swim. So I, um, I could swim when I was two. I think I was probably doing butterfly by the time I was, I was three. And I just... I just always remember loving it. Like, So you I, were a water baby. I was a water baby, total water baby. I think all of us was. Honestly, I have four children myself. They're okay. all water babies too. So there's something genetic here. There's something genetic, yeah. It's the, it's the gills behind the ears is the giveaway, isn't it, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just right here. No, um, so I just always loved it. And it was something that we always did. And, you know, as we got older, my mom put us all into swim club. Um, we were in a small town in um, the UK called Hazemere you know, local, local swim team. And yeah. we were all part of that team. And I remember tagging along with my siblings and we'd all go, I think it must've been at this point when I joined a club seven or eight. And you'd already been swimming for, for five or six years at this point. Yeah. Yeah. That was probably an advantage, right? <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I would think so. I, was, I already kind of knew how to swim and I always remember being kind of the youngest and racing the older people and were you because like were you would you race your siblings and if you have all those older siblings you're always the smallest the youngest and the littlest do you did you remember always, I think they pretty much always beat me until I got older and even today actually my brothers would still maybe beat me over like a 20 yard dash um so sons of guns yeah yeah <laughs> they get a good they get a good kick out of it but um I mean this is a podcast so people can't see the expression on your face when you say your brothers can still beat you in a 20-yard dash but there's like this little furrowed brow like yeah <laughs> I'm like I'm competitive I'll give it a, I'll give it a good race um but it's good fun it's all good fun right but I yeah I remember from a very young age it was kind of you know what I did and what I was good at and I think when you're good at something you just naturally gravitate towards it and you know, honestly, as I got older, I remember, you know, if I was sick, I would still go swimming and go to practice, but I would miss school, right? It was very right. clear that it was my priority. And, you know, my mother, she got up at 4 a.m. for oh, boy. many, many years to get me to a swimming pool. So um, very supportive there. But yeah, it was it was always fun and the the priority. So. so I'm an ice hockey dad. My kids played ice hockey. So I know what it's like to uh, get, have to get to the facility at the time slot where it's available to you. So quick shout out to all the ice hockey and swim parents out there who are getting their kids and waking up before the roosters even get up to be able to do that. It is an incredible amount of dedication that goes through. And something that you're experiencing with your kids now. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of dedication. You know, my my mom did a lot of it. We shared it with other parents um, that had swimmers that had to travel. So originally when it was our local swim team, it wasn't so far, but then we moved down to Portsmouth. It was a 30 minute drive and yeah. 
you know, swimmers were swimming twice a day, every day, um, <sighs> from dawn and then towards the end of the day. But it just kind of became what we did. But, you know, it's the same with my kids. If if they love something and they're passionate about it, like that's such a joy to see and to be part of. And being part of any sport, whether it's swimming or something else, is like such a great, you know, a great thing to be part of, a great skill to learn. You know, you you get out what you put in. So it's only right. something I'd ever encourage with my kids. So we'll see if they ever get to competitive swimming <laughs> and I have to get up at 4 a.m. We'll see. It's competitive for both of you. Was there ever this point where you were like, ah, geez, as a kid, I don't, I don't know if I want to get up this early anymore. Or was it always something that you looked at as being like, I can't wait to get in the pool? I don't think I'd ever say I can't wait to get in the pool. I don't think it ever crossed my mind that I couldn't get up in the morning, though. Mm. I had this, um, and I still have it today. I I feel guilty. I would have felt guilty if I missed a practice. Wow. Okay. So, so there's a big inner drive. how hard I was. I was still going to go because if I didn't go to practice, somebody else was going to go to practice and get an edge on me. And that was always in the back of my mind. So So you were competitive from the jump. I mean, this is not something you had to learn to develop. I mean, this sounds like this was and maybe it was formulated with that inherent competition with your family members. But that's really sounds like it's intrinsic to you. That feeling of I don't want that person to get that edge. Yeah, I think it's more competitive with myself though if that makes sense yes yeah, okay. I wanted to be uh, other people of course but it was more yeah if I don't get up I'm not going to be as good as I could be so I think it's for me it's actually more competitive with myself and making sure I can be the best that I can be and then the competing with other people is the fun part I think so yeah it's it's an interesting way to look at it at what point did you start to feel like so I mean you're you're you're, you're doing all the swim clubs and you're competing through school and everything like that at what point did you become aware that A, the Olympics was a thing and B, you know, I can do that. I could compete in the games. I'm, I'm that high a level. That's a really interesting question. I, I don't have an exact answer. Mm, okay. I don't think there was necessarily a moment in time where I questioned it. It was just something that I did. I remember when I was 12 and I first competed in national age groups and I was still at the smaller club. And I think I came third. I think it became clear that I had to transition to a larger club to, okay, right, yeah. to get better. But I think at that point, when you start, you know, meddling as an age grouper, it, it becomes clear that, you know, that you maybe have the ability. I actually came third in the Olympic trials when I was 16. They only take the top two oh. to Olympics. Um, it was a little unexpected, though. So you surprise yourself. Yeah, I surprised myself. And I think as soon as that happened, it was, you know, something that I clearly believed in and, and dreamed of. Well, I'm sorry, just but, but in that moment when you surprised yourself like that, was that like a wow, I did really well or damn it, I just missed the Olympics? I think it was a more wow, I did really well. I remember yeah. we worked. I mean, swimming is never I shouldn't say surprised. It's like everything. Uh -huh. We worked incredibly hard at it. Yeah. And you're very aware that the next stage is coming and that you're going to do best times and, and things like that. So I was aware that I was kind of on the cusp, but I think it was still a surprise as a 16 year old to come third at Olympic trials. Like, I think that was a surprise. The and 16 is still I'm, relatively young, right? I mean, it's, young. Yeah, it's actually right. then. I mean, you definitely have 15, 16 year olds go to the Olympics um, and obviously win the Olympics. But, you know, by the time I was 20, which is when Sydney 2000 was, the experience at Olympic trials was completely different. It was far more pressure, far more expectation. Mm -hmm. You had expectations yeah, there was now. expectations, yes. So it was different. But you succeeded in those. You were in the top two. You went on to swim in the 2000 Sydney Games. I, I mean, I, I'm going to, I have a confession here. Um, I am not an Olympic athlete. <laughs> and I'm one, <laughs> they don't laugh, Sorry. Marty. <laughs> It's like, it can't be that. It's not that obvious. <laughs> but I mean, for the layman, right, for someone who's never, like, that's never been a goal, right? Because it's just so fantastical, right? Can you describe what that's like when this is, you know, clearly something you had been working towards and competing toward to get to this position when you make that ultimate goal when you have that opportunity to compete in the games what can you share what that kind of initial experience is like you go th into the stadium and the welcoming ceremony and is it just two weeks of oh my god or 
it doesn't really just become a big swim meet. It's a really big swim meet, but it's also a magical moment. I mean, it's for all of us, even for people who have competed in multiple Olympics. I only competed in one, but I have many friends that were in multiple. It's a magical moment. It's, you know, even the every time. championships, you know, every two years, um, the Olympics is really a very special moment. And I actually didn't get to go to the opening oh, okay. ceremonies because I was swimming the next day. And, you know, there was a, hand- oh. <laughs> there was a handful of us. in Scheduling situation. issues. Yeah. But still, I mean, I, I, yeah, I did. It was a very special moment, a very special moment to share, especially with my family and my friends. Um, but there's also to your question of whether it's another big swim meet, it really is right. It's still for me, I did 200 butterfly it's four lengths butterfly. And I had to remind myself, it doesn't matter which swimming pool it is, where it is in the world. It's four lengths butterfly. You have to kind of like, otherwise you, your mind can kind of go in all different places. The moment becomes too big. Yeah, it becomes too big. But that's part of the the specialness of it. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit of both. You do. So you do able to drill down in the fact, okay, it's four lengths of the pool. Yeah. Just like the pool we have back in England that I've been swimming in my whole life. All right. So it's hitting that reset almost in your, it speaks to the, the mental part of a physical uh, competition, right? There, there's the huge mental component associated with that. And just being able to train yourself to step out of the bigness of it, to concentrate on the small moment that is your race. I mean, it's, do you have to train yourself for that? Is it something you came by naturally? I think you have to train yourself, but I think it really comes down to gaining the experience. I was a someone mm-hmm. who got very nervous um, mm-hmm. and I had to train myself that that feeling of like, really fast heartbeat was just a way to know that I really care about it. And I yep. to try and channel that energy into something positive, but there was always that like feeling of, I actually cannot wait for this to be over. So these <laughs> feelings of nervousness. <laughs> um, it's kind of like podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but every athlete has it. And I think that's what you have to remember as well. Right. Like no one is a, no one is, is, is everyone's human. Uh, so everyone has these feelings. Uh, right. Everyone cares about it. Everyone has worked blood, sweat, and tears to get where they are and, um, is putting everything on the line into the two minute race that's about to come in front of you. So was having your race on that <laughs> basically first day, what, did, that, did that end up actually being a cool thing? Did you just get to do your race and just sort of hang out for two weeks? So I wish it was that easy. My, uh, darn it. Yeah, would have been great, right? Um, <laughs> I actually qualified for the 100 butterfly, which was the one that came first. And then I swam 200 butterfly was by far my better event. And that was on the last mm-hmm. day, which is difficult because oh. you have to sit through everybody else's swimming and wait till the very end just thinking about it yeah. oh my gosh that, that's a little stressful but it was nice to kind of have a warm-up swim for me and yeah as soon as it's we at the beginning we're at the beginning of the olympic games and we were really lucky once the swimming finished to go watch some other sports actually yeah, yeah i always yeah. remember watching kind of stephen redgrave and the 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 rowers win the gold medal for great britain too which was kind of a big deal at the time so mm-hmm. there's pluses and minuses right where you fall in the schedule Right. It's really capricious. There's no really a way to control that. But I'm wondering if you have a moment from those games. You just talked about seeing the rowers win. Are there is there a moment that really stands out to you as sort of your definitive Olympic moment? And I'm thinking maybe perhaps even outside competing or like maybe standing in the blocks or something like that. Or is there I mean, there's so much that's made about the Olympic spirit and the Olympic movement. And I'm wondering if you have a moment that sticks out to you in your time there or something that really embodies that. Yeah, so before my race, Eric the Eel was swimming. I don't know if you remember Eric the Eel. Um, he was a swimmer from Equatorial Guinea, I believe. Um, and I have never heard a crowd be so loud for a swimmer. And it was right before my race. And because he was actually one of the first heats, like I remember looking around the curtain, like there's all that there's like a green room, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, for swimmers and even just watching that and even thinking about it still gives me goosebumps to think that like that's what the Olympics is all about right I mean that here was a guy who I don't think had ever seen an Olympic sized swimming pool you know stand up there and 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 swim with all his heart and the, the crowd behind him like I that would that's a really strong memory and obviously nothing to do with me competing but I was 
part of that experience. And I think you know, if anybody doesn't know the story of, of Eric the Eel, it's worth looking up 2000 Olympics and to see, I'm sure it's on YouTube or something like that, to see his heat and the crowd's reaction to it about, it's such a great example of exactly what I was just mentioning, this idea of the Olympic spirit and the power of human competition and even if you're not the you know, if you're not i think of at the time that was also like ian thorpe's olympics right the torpedo mm -hmm. like it was just winning everything in sight even if you're time zones from being ian thorpe how the shared human experience can really rally around this person who's trying to give it their all the first time like you said first time they've even been in a pool that size yeah it was incredible all right so closing ceremonies come did you have aspirations to try again to be in a future Olympics or was this kind of like, okay, I did it. Yeah, it's time to do the next thing. I swam the quickest I ever swam in Sydney. And so mm -hmm. I did have aspirations. I think what happened after Sydney is I think life happened. I went through a really, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't motivated afterwards. I went through that period of this ultimate high in sport and then, you know, it's four years till the next one. And sure, there's there's definitely swimming competitions in between. But I I realized that, like, I wanted to do something more than just swim. And so I was trying to figure out how to get a degree and figure out what my mind was already like, what am I going to do after swimming a little bit? And I think that was distracting. Um, and so after a couple of years of maybe not really knowing what I wanted to do, I ended up moving to the United States, got recruited to USC which was awesome, swam um, a couple of collegiate years there, found my love of swimming again, actually, which was really, really fun. So you did hit a little bit of a reset after the games. Is that a common thing for Olympic athletes to have this post-game kind of letdown? It is such a big, huge moment, and then it's over? I think it's common. I think it's common. You have to, you have to pick yourself back up and find the same drive which in some cases I'm sure people can do. In my case, as I say, I'd, I maybe got to the stage where I was like, what am I going to do after swimming? So I had that in the back of my mind. Yeah, I was just kind of in this moment of transition and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And it reflected in my performance in the pool. And I did actually in 2002, I won a medal in the Commonwealth Games in Manchester, which made me realize I still love swimming. And I'd actually come forth a lot in my career and to finally get a medal at major games was huge. Um, mm -hmm. And I and to go do something different, which was part of my motivation to go to USC. Okay, so go off to USC, off to Southern California, basically the exact same kind of weather as you have in your hometown <laughs> of England, I'm certain. Yes. Um, and that sort of begins this new experience, competing collegiately, getting the degree, um, and starting to look towards, okay, what does come after swimming? And I'm wondering then, let's to just transition away from maybe competitive swimming, was that transition to we'll call it the professional world quote unquote was that a smooth one or an abrupt one did you just kind of seamlessly transition or, or how did that work for you i don't think it was necessarily seamless um yeah they really yeah. are <laughs> oh it was a piece of cake yeah a piece of cake i knew exactly what i wanted to do it's very interesting <laughs> it's very interesting trying to start at the bottom of a ladder again Oh. And also not really knowing what you want to do. Like with being an athlete, it's very clear what your goals are and what you're working towards. And, you know, I when I retired from swimming, I, I felt like I had this label of swimmer on my forehead. And I actually mm. wanted to get it. It was your identity. Yeah, it was my identity, which, of course, I liked. But I wanted to be more than that and achieve more than that. So when I graduated, I actually moved to New York. And in my head, I was like, I'm going to move away from swimming. I'm going to do some, something completely different. And I played around in like uh, event management, which mm -hmm. I really enjoy, but it wasn't quite what I wanted to do. And you know, right. I, I kind of, long story short, I figured out that my identity as a swimmer and an athlete is actually a really important part of me. And mm. I really wanted to get back into the sports industry. Um, so you really felt though that you needed to disassociate yourself from being an athlete to I to figure out what your identity was going to be after an athlete. You, was it, it was like sort of a difficult perception. You could carry that along with you. Yeah. I don't know why I thought that at the time, but yes, I was like, okay. In my mind, I was like, okay, my swimming career is over. I need to go do something different. What right. I didn't realize at the time is actually I can have a career in the sports world. Um, I just didn't make that connection. And I think it's difficult when you've, 
you're moving from one thing to another and you don't know you don't you don't know what your path should be and how you should get there and so you have to try some things and I you know right. I did some jobs that didn't particularly love um but I don't regret any of it I think you have to kind of go but you learn that. something from all yeah, of them you don't do. you <laughs> you do you have to go through it to figure out what you learn that do. I don't want to do that anymore yeah. <laughs> yeah we have we all have our strengths and weaknesses right do you feel like there were skill like during this period of time when you're in transition, do you feel like there were skills you developed as an athlete that helped you in this moment? Was there like, like the whole, I'm used to getting up at four o'clock in the morning and, you know, grinding through to practice and, you know, were, was that anything that carried over that you found was just instrumental for you in that, in that beginning, that new part of your life? Yeah, I think resilience, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're looking for a job, um, or whatever it is, you have to be, you have to get used to not always succeeding and working through hard times to get to good times. So mm -hmm. I definitely had the mindset and the, I'm quite an optimistic person. I always have the theory that it's going to work out. Right. And so mm -hmm. um, I definitely had that going, going into it. There's so many things that athletes bring to the professional world. That I'm sure I did at the beginning and I see it today. Like even in our group at, you know, Visa, we have a lot of athletes. I mean, there's not one athlete out there that didn't work incredibly hard. And that translates into the working world, right? Teamwork is another thing that kind of really comes through, right? And I, I apply in my everyday work, and I'm sure I did at the beginning. Um, I think there's a lot of um, important transferable skills from the being an athlete going into the corporate world. Do you speak with the other former high level athletes and sort of talk about like help them through that moment as I mean, because you are now looking back on this with some experience, right? I mean, is there is there an opportunity for you to be able to engage and say, hey, look, this may seem hard right now. But you know, these things that you know how to do really help you as you transit make this transition? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly there's there's lots of athletes, um, both that I was competing with, at, you know, at the time, and ones that are kind of finishing up their career now that, you know, regular have regular conversations. And there's a ton that I can learn from from them as well. And at Visa, we actually have a um, champions program from mm. the Olympics and the NFL side. So we have some NFL players and some Olympians actually work at Visa. Um, it gives them the ability to test out what they may like to do. There's kind of an eight month rotation mm -hmm. um, and they can figure out what they, what, what they are interested in and what they're good at. So there's, you know, Visa's doing a great job at providing a, a path, but yeah, so I talked to those athletes um, a fair amount and, you know, anything I can do to help really, I think yeah. we're all kind of in it together a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about your role at Visa. It's one of the biggest event marketing, sponsorship marketing, partnership marketing companies on the planet. Can you talk a little bit about working there and your current role and what your responsibilities are? Yeah. So I've been at Visa a little over six years um, at this point, and I lead some of our North America partnerships. Specifically, I manage the NFL relationship, our NFL team relationships, um, a couple of other U.S. sports properties, and I also work with a couple of entertainment properties. Um, I do anything from managing the relationship, uh, negotiating contracts, uh, creating strategic plans to activate, um, and then also the implementation. So other than that, not much. Yeah, not much. No. <laughs> yeah, it's just the NFL, whatever. Yeah. It's not that big a deal. Yeah. And this is a quiet time of year for you too. So just taking time out to do this podcast is a piece of cake. Yeah, we got that little <laughs> event happening in a couple of weeks in Phoenix. So yeah, we, we should probably note that the Super Bowl is in about two weeks. And, <laughs> and Mar Margie's got some responsibilities associated with doing that. I mean, it's interesting though, because you are, like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, this is a very, very experienced partnership marketer and dealing with sponsorships and everything like that. And you're mm -hmm. currently overseeing one of the most significant parts of that portfolio. I'm wondering if there's, given all that experience and given all that history, is there pressure to innovate with partnerships or is it, Hey, this is the way we do things and let's just don't change. It's already, it, don't change what works. I mean, innovation, uh, innovation is at the core of what Visa does. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would call it pressure, but I think, you know, part of our jobs is to continue and continually test ourselves and do things differently. Right. I think mm -hmm. if you just rinse and repeat. 
Um, I don't think that would really move the, the needle. I think it's really important to change things up, be nimble, try and make sure that you are reaching fans or consumers in, in different ways and getting them to think a little bit differently about the brand. So I think it, I think it's crucial actually to continue to to push yourself, push ourselves to do something different. Yeah, I think marketing changes so particularly now. I mean, it's you know, if you you go to bed one night and you wake up the next morning, the marketing world has changed and a new technology has come along or a new social media platform has been introduced. There is this constant need to stay or I should say try to stay ahead mm -hmm. of what's going on and being able to adapt to those. Because also sports like the NFL tend to be one of the first places to start leveraging some of these new platforms and opportunities that come along because of the nature of the content that they deliver. Is that one of the things that Visa finds value in that, like that ability to take that content and use it to support the brand and, and highlight the relationship between the two? That's what can charge consumers with um, hopefully take that excitement they feel about the NFL and bring it over to the, to the Visa brand? Yeah, I mean, content is key, right? I think we as an organization try and make sure that, you know, we are in the payments industry, right? So we want mm -hmm. to make sure that everything that we can to make the fan experience better, we are doing, right? We want fans to have seamless payment experiences so they can go back to enjoy the game quicker, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's just really important that we do move quickly. We do remain culturally relevant. Right. Um, we also have a lot of different stakeholders at Visa, right? We are, a, yeah. we have internal clients, we have external, we have B2B. There's there's a lot of different stakeholders. And I think that's the really cool thing about our sponsorships is we have the ability to engage with all of them and kind of um, work with our sponsorships so it's successful across all those different stakeholders. I know this is obviously, we're getting to that two week period right now where it's a culmination of what is literally a year's worth of attention and focus with all the things that are gonna be going on down in Arizona. Is there an activation or something taking place down there that you're especially looking forward to? I'm gonna wait and let you guys see it in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> all I'm this say. is a perfect place to release all your yeah, plans. Yeah, it's like, maybe if it's with two weeks time, I, I could, but I mean, we, I mean, Every Super Bowl, we 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 obviously activate really heavily. I mean, last year, I mean, talk about leaning into innovation. Like last draft, we worked with some really cool hologram technology. You know, okay, Bowl, yeah. We're really about uplifting communities, and we we really want to help minority-owned small businesses. So we did a, a lot of work to support that community in LA last year. So yeah, some fun stuff is going to come up here uh, in Arizona for for people. What is Super Bowl week? And I'm asking this specific obviously because this is your this is your area of focus and you're managing this piece of business. Do, do you get to sleep at <laughs> all during Super Bowl week? Is it just a constant running around of mayhem or is everything just kind of smoothly operating? You just get to go on and, and, and enjoy the event. Um, I love to say it's smoothly operating. I mean, <laughs> We are spoken like a true event marketer. Yeah, right we are a pretty well oiled machine. We yeah. we have the luxury that we've done this a few times now, but anyone who works on events, things happen. And even when they go hundred percent to plan, it's still always crunch time, right? Yeah. Um, and things happen that you can't necessarily control. But honestly, I mean, I, I love my job. I think anyone who works on the Super Bowl probably does. Um, we get to work with phenomenal athletes. Um, Venice, uh, Visa is a great company to work with. Our employees and our team are really kind of the best in the industry. And I actually kind of thrive on the craziness of the five days or six days, whatever it is that we're on the ground in Phoenix. And, you know, it, you catch up with people that you haven't seen for a year, all whilst trying to make sure the programs that we have in place all uh come to fruition without <laughs> anything happening <laughs> do you feel like you i mean you obviously have this natural competitiveness as developed as an athlete does that carry over into representing the brand like if some of the other competitor brands are doing something cool down there do you go like oh i mean obviously you've got some exclusivity going down at the super bowl per se but if you see another activation from a competitor does it really just heighten your level of gosh we want to do better than that make sure just take that down I don't think so i think all boats rise really. okay i think i actually think it's you know for the most part i think it's you know it's exciting to see what other brands are doing um and you know exploring how they are 
showing up and trying to reach you know fans and consumers and reach their business objectives i actually i i, I get fascinated by what other brands are doing all right rising can, tide lifts yeah. all ships yeah you can <laughs> ask me maybe after super bowl but yeah. I'll see what happens if there's one of the competitor brands are trying to do some gorilla stuff next to the Super Bowl and you're out there torpedoing whatever it is they're trying to do. So, okay, Marky Petter, Senior Director of Global Partnerships at Visa. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. Uh, but before I let you go, I am, as discussed, going to put you through the lightning round. Uh -oh. All right. These are okay. some short, short questions. Marky, all I'm asking from you is quick answers. First thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? I'm ready. Are you sure you're ready? <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> All right. You used to hold the uh, Great Britain rec record in the 100 meter and 200 meter butterfly. Uh, how irritated were you when those records were broken? Oh, um, irritated is the wrong word. The t my 200 butterfly record was broken whilst I was swimming next to her. She's Georgina Lee. I was swimming next to her in Sydney. So I wasn't oh. irritated, but that's how that happened. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll just say that we'll keep suppressed irritation because you were <laughs> swimming. You couldn't really do it. All right. As someone originally from the UK, what NFL rule are you still trying to figure out? Oh, there's so many, honestly. I, don't know where to start. <laughs> I Pick love one. the game, but sometimes I'm like, can someone, you know, what happened there? Yeah. What, what, why wasn't that a catch? Okay. So <laughs> which food from the UK do you miss the least? Uh, mushy peas. I don't understand mushy peas. I can't even understand what you just <laughs> even said. It's like it's just like you broke my you broke my mind. All right, last one. Uh, what's your reaction when I tell you that in college I spent one month on a synchronized swimming team and needed floats strapped to my ankles to stay afloat? I think that's hilarious, and I'd be very impressed if you actually did that. I will. Spend, well, it'll be another podcast for another time later today. I just had an Olympic swimmer tell me that she was impressed with the fact that I was on a synchronized swimming team for exactly one month. <laughs> Margie Patter, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. We'll chat soon. Good luck in Arizona. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for listening to this ADC Partners podcast. For more information about ADC Partners, please visit our website at adcpartners.com.